Hello everyone. This is Shobha from CNS. Welcome to the second episode of APCR SHR Dialogues, a special series of online interviews every fortnight with leaders in Asia Pacific on the overarching theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific 2030 Sustainable Development Goals Vision and 2020 Realities. This is also the theme of the forthcoming 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights which we know more commonly call APCR SHR 10 a long name but a long fight ahead of us also. For the benefit of our audience these dialogues will be streamed live on facebook pages of apcr shr and cns in today's episode of the dialogue we are indeed fortunate to have with us mr beyond anderson regional director for asia and the pacific at unfpa united nations population fund welcome mr anderson we are really grateful to you thank you so much shobha it's a pleasure to be here with you and now just a few housekeeping announcements for the viewers before we begin today's dialogue those of you who are using zoom platform can type in your comments and questions in the chat box which you must be seeing on your screen and unmute yourself to speak at the end of the dialogue or raise the virtual hand if you are watching it on facebook live you can leave a comment there and we will try to take up as many comments as possible please keep your questions and comments short and precise so that more people get a chance to have their say uh mr anderson as we know the theme of the 10th asia pacific conference on reproductive and sexual health and rights is sr hr in asia pacific sdg 2030 vision and 2020 realities where are we in the region on sr hr that is sexual and reproductive health and rights in terms of 2020 and the 2030 goals Thank you, Shobha. I mean, this is one of the key questions to ask ourselves as we are moving ahead and as we are coming in closer to the conference in Cambodia. First of all, it's it's very difficult to say that there is one region in Asia and the Pacific. It varies very much from the western part to the Pacific to the eastern part of the region, and we just need to keep that in mind when we are discussing uh, Asia and the Pacific. that the, it it's such a diverse region and it's such a diverse in terms of of history in terms of uh, norms and values economic growth and and social development but that is also why it makes it so interesting for us at UNFPA to work very closely with partners in this region but just to to recap that the uh, the 2030 sustainable development target on goal number 3 ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for for all at all ages we have a target which is specifically uh, geared towards maternal mortality ratio and uh, it says that by 2030 the global target should be that the ratio should be less than 70% per 100,000 live births so if we look then more closely to the asia pacific we can see that over the past um 20 years or so we have had a decrease of 56% in maternal mortality uh, but still 10 women 10 women are dying every hour in this region and that is not acceptable and this is where we need to uh, you know focus even more in order to address the challenges related to maternal health and to the broader perspective of sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights and and uh, for, for me and for us at at UNFPA we look at this region seeing the economic growth the quick changes which are taking place but the increased inequalities and inequities whether it's between men and women the gender inequality between those who have those who are living in urban areas or those who are remaining in in the rural areas between different groups of of um, of people ethnic minorities or or uh, other groups who are living under vulnerable situations so this is something we need to remember when we, we when we are talking about access to maternal health or access to sexual and reproductive health and we can also see uh, in many countries and in many parts of countries also pushback on on sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights 
social conservatives. It's a different, um, uh, different thinking around how people should have access to sexual and reproductive health services. And that varies between countries. So we need to continue to focus on a number of things if we are going to achieve the target of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. One is to improve the quality of maternal health care, uh, support, and, and also through supporting policy changes to include more evidence-based practices. We need to train more midwives. It's a critical human resources in order to lower maternal mortality and to improve the sexual and reproductive health among all people. And we also need to make sure that we increase the access to compre more comprehensive emergency obstetric care when it's needed. And finally, health system strengthening in general, where we are talking about you know, universal health coverage for everybody to access. But like I said, there is not a quick fix solution and changing norms, values, people's perceptions, people's uh, behavior and making sure that governments are allocating domestic resources for sexual and reproductive health, it takes time. But we are making progress and that's the important part to keep in mind, even though we are not there yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, just an announcement for the viewers. Uh, please switch off your videos uh, while the um, dialogue is taking place. And later on, you can switch it on when we want to speak. Thank you. Uh, Beyond, uh, what are the challenges in addressing harmful practices which we see all around us in the region, like uh, girl, early girl child marriage, early motherhood? Uh, discriminatory norms and patriarchal systems that are reinforcing gender inequality and uh, impacting SRHR in this region. Thank you, Shobha. I, I would not, you know, the, the overall goal for UNFPA, we, we're talking about the three zeros, and one of these three zeros is zero, uh, uh, zero preventable maternal death which I just spoke about. Yes. But the second zero is about harmful practices. And here again, it's not easy to just say that this is a solution for the whole region. You need to look into how the situation is in, in certain parts of, of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, but if you look at, at, at the global level, and, and if we focus, if I, let me start with gender-based violence. One out of three women globally uh, have experienced gender-based violence throughout their lifetime. And that is just a figure which is, for me, mind-boggling, how that can be still so high in, in to today's societies when we know how to, you know, uh, hopefully to prevent and work with both men and women to, to make sure that, that that is not happening. And, and it varies again. If you look at countries, for example, the Philippines and, and Laos and Bhutan, it's down to 15%. In, in this region. But then you have in other countries, in the Pacific, for example, or some island, island countries, it, it's over 60%. So of course, governments and partners would have to ask, like we are doing in UNFPA in our country offices, why is this happening? Why is it so high in certain countries? And to see how we can tackle uh, targeted intervention in order to lower that. And we are uh, sponsoring a, a project that we call that we call No Wow Data. So at least we know what's happening in countries. So we have the data. And in so many circumstances, when it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender equality, gender-based violence, if you present the data to governments, you know it's very very difficult not to accept data if it's done properly. And you know, that is the basis for many of our interactions and in our dialogues with, with government partners to give them the data. So this NAWAB data, it's, it's actually, it's, it's provide, providing the state of the art technical support to countries to undertake prevalent surveys. So we have done it in a number of countries to make sure that we have the, that we all know what's happening in, in those countries. If you then talk about, Marriage. We also know that that um, uh, you know the early, like girl child marriage and early motherhood, are also varying. It's varies between between countries in the region and in countries like in Bangladesh. It's uh, um, we know that 
you know, girls marrying before the age of 18, it's almost 60%. In Nepal, it's 40%. In Afghanistan, 35%. So it varies between the countries. But, and, and we know also that, for example, in South Asia, that we're seeing the rates of child marriage coming down. And that is uh, primarily because of the situation in India in terms of child marriage. But if you look at harmful practices in a broader sense, including gender-based violence, again, what we at UNFPA, how we are working with our partners is really to talk about what, how are the laws and the policies in the countries and how can we work together with faith-based organizations, with government partners, with civil society to change norms and also to make sure that we have uh, that we repeal discriminatory laws and policies in countries. So, so that's one thing. But, you know, I, from my own experience, it takes years to change people's behavior and the norms and values in, in societies. But having strong and, and to promote strong national human rights institutions is key in this regard, to make sure that, that we make changes within societies, that people and individuals and societies understand human rights and what a human rights violation is all about. Because if you break it down, there is nobody in any societies, I think, who would like to, you know, hurt, you know, family members or, or marrying the daughters if they understand what is going on. So it is very important to combine the changes in laws, in, in norms, values, and also to promote human rights in this respect. But again, like I said, when it comes, when we talked about maternal health just recently, I, th I think also the, the, it is it's absolutely key that um, we understand what's happening in societies in terms of conservatism and, and changes, the pushback. And you know, the pushback, we can, we can never accept that. We can never accept pushback on our agenda. And that became very clear when we last year, when UNFPA organized a big summit in Nairobi on ICPD, the International Conference on Population and Development, that we need to push back on the pushbackers, but we need to understand where this is coming from in societies. And, you know, it changes over, over years, it changes from one, from one, it can basically change overnight when you have a change in governments. The view on, on women, on gender equality, on human rights, on key populations, we, you know, I'm hope, I hope we can talk a little bit around key populations in relation to HIV AIDS later on. But these things are so important that we understand what's happening so that we can strategize together. And there is no solution, no, nobody, not a single organization or a, you know, can address this. We need to do it together. And I think that's part of the solutions for gender-based violence early, you know, early, you know, child marriage and forced marriages. Thanks. I get very, you know, very engaged in this matter because it's really something which is so unacceptable in, in any society. And it, it is not just here in Asia and the Pacific that we can see that. We can see it in, in any country around yeah. the world. Uh, are there any sparks of light in this, in this gloomy darkness? Can you share some best practice examples of countries which are doing better than others? And why you took one example of Philippines? Can you share some? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, if you look at, at if you look at gender-based violence, for example, in countries like Japan, the Philippines, Laos, or Bhutan, it is around fifteen percent, which is mm -hmm. much much lower than in other countries. Mm -hmm. So, I, I should say we know what works, and we know that there are good things happening in many countries. And like I said, even though there are challenges with with you know gender equality in South Asia. You know, changes have been made in India to lower the rate of child marriage, for example, which shows that for, for South Asia, it is decreasing. So I think, no, I, I, I mean, it, it's just that we cannot take all of these, all, all of the progress for granted. Human, human rights and gender equality is something we constantly have to work on to, to make sure that there is no backlash. It, it never, and, and you know, when I've been working with UNFPA for the past 25 years, and whenever I speak to younger people, I say, don't think that the, the progress we have made and, and the light that we can see, don't take it for granted because it can change quickly. 
But if, you, if you're talking about, for example, which is very much related to child marriage, teenage pregnancies, we see that there are changes as well, you know, and mm -hmm. positive ones. Yes. So my next question is about teenage oh, pregnancy. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Dion, because we see it is on the rise in many countries of the region. And can you please help us understand the, the factors responsible for this? Uh, and another thing I want to add here is that uh, Thailand is one country which uh, I feel has made significant progress on gender equality. Um, a, rel a relatively safer place for women, transgenders and other marginalized communities. Uh, Yet, teenage pregnancy rate is quite high in Thailand as well. So, can you help us understand that? I, I will try. I will try, Shobha. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure I have all the answers to this, yes, but that's yes, why yes. we're having these dialogues and the conference yes. in, in May. But yes. let me start by saying this. The way I see it, in, in Asia and the Pacific, the economic growth is so fast. It is, it's, you know, the economic development is really going much quicker than in many other regions and, 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 and also much quicker than in Europe. But still, the traditions, the norms and values are not changing as fast as the economic growth. And I think this is very unique in, in the Asia Pacific region that we don't see that, you know, if you look at, at you know, I, I can look at my own country, Sweden, or other European countries. The economic growth took time and, and the social norms and women's empowerment, the women's movement, you know, you know, developed in the same pace as the economic growth. But here you find yourself in a situation where you have perhaps ethnic minorities, where you have elderly who are remaining in the rural areas who are not benefiting from the economic growth in the same way as perhaps the, the younger or, or the more, the, you know, the... the um, um, you know the the you know the the working population the working population, but let me come back to this on adolescence pregnancies. The the positive things which I think you know we should also very much uh, grab uh, grab to it. It's that it has in in the region as a whole, adolescence pregnancy has decreased by almost fifty percent over the last two decades. I think that's an important figure to to remember, and. Um, much of the reduction of adolescence pregnancy has taken place in South Asia. Uh, and, and it's linked to what we just discussed, Shoba, uh, around uh, uh, reduction in, in child marriage. But in certain parts, especially in Southeast Asia, and like you rightly point out, pointed out, Thailand, it has increased, or you know, the rates have stagnated or, or, in, or even increased. So for Southeast Asia now, you have 47% of 1,000 girls. That's the, the adolescent birth rate in this sub-region. And, um, you know, the drivers of adolescence pregnancies in, 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 in all of these sub-regions or part of, of Asia Pacific, you know, the more that we discuss it, the more we learn about it, the more complex it becomes. And we have limited evidence. So that's why... We at UNFPA now, this year, we are undertaking a stud study on the pathways to adolescence pregnancy in Southeast Asia, so that we better understand what, what is happening. But um, in, on a general basis, we all know, for example, that the use of contraceptives, modern contraceptives, you require constant information and discussion access to contraceptive services or family planning services. You need access to the broader spectrum of sexual and reproductive health information and, and communication. And many schools and many governments have come pretty far when it comes to comprehensive sexuality education, even though we call it, it's called differently in different countries. So there is a, again here a palette of, of um, uh, interventions that that need to take place in, in, uh, to better understand what's happening in societies when it comes to adolescent pregnancies. But, but for sure, you need to be able to address the unmet need of contraceptions and making sure that it becomes, um, uh, that there is no stigma around using modern contraceptives and, and that you can actually have access to it. Uh, and, and as a young adult or as, a young, as an adolescent, that you can go and buy it without any fear of stigma or comments or anything. 
again, that is also linked, like, like we talked about before, in laws and policies. And like I said, the comprehensive sexuality education is important in this, to this end. But Thailand, again, what they have recently done, they have um, um, adopted a what they call a Teenage Pregnancy Act. And that's a good example with, with this multi-sectoral approach, with, with, which includes a large focus on comprehensive sexuality education, as, as I mentioned. And I think that that's part of the solution that you need to constantly, constantly see this. And, and um, we know, for example, that um, campaigns around, you know, how you prevent HIV transmission, or, you know, if you do that constantly, people use safe, you know, use safer sex. But what we have seen lately also is it's increased, uh, uh, you know, prevalence of, of STIs. Of, of, and, and that is also something, you know, you need to ask yourself, but why is that happening? And, and uh, slightly, you know, which is slightly a different topic, but, you know, if you look at the STIs, yes, we think, yes, we have vaccines, we have medications against it. But why is it increasing? What, what's happening in societies that makes STIs uh, being spread much more uh, faster than, than previously. Yeah, right. And you mentioned about uh, the unmet need for family planning, which uh, from what I remember, I think there are around 140 million women uh, in the Asia Pacific region with unmet uh, need for family planning. Uh, male condom use is low, at least in a country like India, it's around 1% or so. And female condom somehow never got really programmed in many countries despite it being another choice tool in the hands of women. And all this has manifested itself in unsafe abortions, avoidable maternal deaths, preventable, as you said, preventable transmission of STIs. Where have we failed down the line? And sometimes this female condom thing is very dear to my, to my heart. Why couldn't we program it? Because in India, I was asking people and they said, well, uh, women don't like it, but many women have not even heard of the name that it does exist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. can you say something? Yeah. So, so when it comes to contraceptive prevalence rate, uh, mm -hmm. we know that also over the past twenty years, it 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 has increased from fifty nine percent to sixty seven percent in in the region. Modern methods of family planning for contraceptives. And, and we also know that the unmet need for family planning services has decreased, or have decreased over the past two years, past two decades, from 17 to 13 percent. So that's a good news. And um, uh, this region, if you compare it to other parts of the world, is advanced. So, so that is a positive, positive development. Um, but again, I think. What is important with family planning uh, me method is, is to make sure that men and women have access to a wide range of modern contraceptives and different options and different methods so that you're not, you're not just limited to, to a few of them. Um, it's also important that we talk, when we talk about contraceptives that they're rice-based. And that was the whole notion at the uh, Cairo conference in 1994 that we went from the macro or the bigger picture to look at individual rights and especially when we talked about voluntary rights-based access to family planning services and including contraceptives obviously. I think also we can be better in closing the gap whether it's a female condom to, to the extent that it actually is available on the market in the region and, and other modern contraceptives is that that we improve again healthcare or healthcare providers to provide, you know, high quality counseling, confidential, uh, that is done in a very respectful manner for both men and women, and uh, um, that they basically that we strengthen their skills in providing quality services to to uh, to men and women, especially women, and again that links back to the discussion we had in the beginning, how important it is with uh, mid mid midwives, for example. And I mean, this is also the year of the midwives, so it's really a very opportune time to, to really put, 
put their work in, in, in the center. Then more on, okay, more on a national level, we need to make sure that the supply chain is effective, that it's effectively maintained, that, that you know, cont modern contraceptive actually reach all countries in all parts of countries. And this region, if you look at many of the um, uh, island states, small islands, very remote, very difficult to reach, not just with, with commodities, but also, of course, with trained and healthcare providers. But again, you have also countries with mountains. You have Nepal, Bhutan, Mongolia. How do you reach populations in different parts of, of countries who live far, far away? And I'm very proud, of course, of my or my, my colleagues in Nepal, for example, who really walks, treks around in the mountains to reach villages that are very hard to, to, to otherwise uh, reach in, in terms of, of services. And then finally, I also believe that if we are going to close the gap for, for, uh, on unmet need for family planning services, contraceptives needs to be affordable. And maybe that was part of the situation with the female condom, because if I remember correctly, it was quite expensive compared to other, other family planning methods. But they need to be affordable and, and of high quality, of course. Thank you. And so it needs to be part of the government program, because male condom in India was cheap, because it was part of the government program. So it was the prices came down mm. a lot. Yeah. Uh, we, you had mentioned key populations, so let us come to that. We have just 10 months left to meet the UNAIDS 90-90-90 targets of 2020 for HIV AIDS. And Cambodia, is, as of now, Cambodia is the only country in this region that has achieved them already. Uh, are there other countries which are on track to achieve them after, say, 10 months? I, yes, I, I mean, it's, it's very... Thank you for highlighting the, the work that uh, has been done in Cambodia to this end. Um, Thailand, for example, is another country where, where you have the, if I'm, if, if I'm been, you know, correctly informed here that in 2019 global AIDS update, um, okay. you know, Thailand is really on track to achieve the targets. You have 94% of people living with HIV, they know the HIV status. 80% living with HIV, they, they know, who know the status, they are also on treatment. And then 95% of, of people living with HIV on treatment in Thailand, they have suppressed viral loads. So Thailand is some, a country coming uh, you know, towards that. And, and I guess it's a combination of good healthcare systems, less stigma around HIV AIDS, preventive measures and, and all of that. Um, but again, here, if we if we are going to achieve um, the 1990-90 targets, it is again you need to. It, it's very much around stigmatization, and I think it's both in societies, but also in healthcare, in health in healthcare situations, um, and and you know some laws in some countries which are not allowing uh, LGBTQ people to to. You know, uh, you know, it's punishable to 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 uh, you know be be gay or lesbian. That of course suppresses the openness and the willingness to test yourself to start with, let alone with treatments and other other medication. So there needs to be again much more done, especially with key populations in countries around prevention, diagnosis, uh, and 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 treatments. And uh, I'm coming back to that all the time. It sounds like, you know, I've recorded it, but, you know, comprehensive sexuality education yes. is key in this regard. And we know that this works in other countries. And, and you know, this is not about, you know, the misconception is that if, if, if students or people, you know, if, 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 pupils, if they have in school access to uh, sexuality education that their sexual activity increases that on the contrary it really shows how you can prevent yourself from HIV or from STIs or becoming pregnant uh, as a teenage girl and and that also more importantly that it, it gives you the uh, the training to to interact between human beings it, it, it's like a foundation if you like between not just between men and women but between all of us that how you are supposed to respect one another that you know wh where the borders go 
that you don't harass girls or women later on. It's that kind of conversation which is equally important in the concept of comprehensive sexuality education. Yes, and uh, uh, no harm in coming back to it again and again beyond because I want to come back to it once oh, right. more. Very good, very good. <laughs> yes. Because uh, we just heard that a Cambodian government will be rolling out comprehensive sexuality, uh, sexuality education from 2022, I think. Uh, right from grades 1 to 12 in schools and they are developing the curriculum around it. So as you have said, and I also believe it is important, how is the rest of the region faring on this? At Thailand also you mentioned, I think they are also doing something on it. Mm -hmm. And maybe the word, uh, as you said, uh, the word sexuality may be a little bit of uh, an anathema to some countries, but uh, that is important. So I would like you to please stress a little more upon the importance of it uh, and, in and, controlling STIs and uh, so many other problems. Which are absolutely. You, and you know, it is, if you look at it in a, in a posit, very positive way, about 25 countries in the region have advanced comprehensive sexuality education in some form or, or, or another. And sometimes it's called family life skills education or, you know, but, but for me, it, the important part is the content of the education. And I have seen in, in countries like in, um, you know, in, in many uh, countries where you, you, you think that this is almost impossible, how teachers are taking the lead in driving comprehensive se sexuality education. If you have the support from the principal, and then you have teachers who are really understanding the need for their students to, to learn about their own bodies, and how they relate to one another, it makes wonders. And I've been in, in you know, projects that UNFPA has uh, around. Some boys were in terms of discussing relations. If you were talking about, you know, gender-based violence and harassment, or, or, or how, if it is really about family planning and how, how you can protect yourself. Because, you know, I think, you know, we, we, would, we, we are making, as grown-ups, a disfavor to young people if we don't allow them the opportunity to learn about themselves. Because that's at, at, the, bottom, at the end of the day, that's what it is. And how we are, are, like I said before, how we are interacting with our, you know, our family members or with our, you know, friends and people that we, you know, later on maybe fall in love with, that we pay that respect to one another. But Cambodia is really spearheading this and then and they're really on on very progressive thinking. But just to mention other countries like Bhutan and, and many of the Pacific Island countries are really, you know, spearheading the discussions around uh, sexuality education. And at the end of the day, what I mean, you ask yourself, what, what, what is the outcome? I mean, it's communication between people. How you communicate about your desires, what you, you're afraid of, and how you see things. It's also about negotiation. I don't want to have sex right now. I don't want to kiss or hug. Or I don't want you, you know, I want my parents to be, you know, show one, one another respect. So it's how you strengthen your negotiation skills in, in your relations. And it's also decision making. I mean, what UNFPA stands for is really that each and every one should be able to choose the partner. And, you know, I'm sure, Shobha, you, you're very well aware of the ICBD program of action. Every, every woman, every individual should be able to choose when and with whom and how many children they would like to have. Exactly. These are basic decisions that we should be able to make as, individu and as, as individuals. Um, so it, it's really an investment, gov a government investment in young people to, you know, so that then they, when they grow up and they become part of a society, that they can can really provide a, a you know, good values, good norms on how we are interacting with one another. So we need, like I said, investment in teacher training, in the skills, and you know, it's not also just in in teaching itself, but it's also for teachers to have a communication with parents, because often it is parents themselves who are very reluctant to allow them to, that their children are, are accessing, have access to 
comp comprehensive se uh, sexuality education. And in many countries, there's also laws and policies, mm -hmm. which, which is a, a common thread in, in our conversation today, and addressing norms and values in societies in general. So, um, you know, I, this is also, I should say, one of the perhaps more sensitive issues that we deal with as UNFPA in many, many countries. Um, and again, we need to put the facts on the table and, and show what, what this leads to in, in societies. And also be very understanding that that might be a fear, you know, parents might be afraid of what's happening. And then have a respectful com communication between teachers and parents and and also when we, from, from UNFPA side, when we, we have a conversation with our government partners and civil society that we, and faith-based organization, that we do it in a respectful way. Because, you know, we, if we are going to be able to overcome the resistance and, and the question marks, we really need to understand where we are coming from. Uh, and, and then, you know, put, put the evidence on the table and move forward. Rightly so, and very right to involve the parents because during my teaching career, I always had a tougher time convincing <laughs> the parents <laughs> rather than students. <laughs> uh, beyond UNFP has done commendable work in combating ageism. I, I'm also part of it. <laughs> Are sexual health and rights adequately addressed for aging populations in the region or what is being done in that regard? You know, this is so interesting question and um, I've been working now in this current function for the past two and a half years. I, I was based in at headquarters previously and I could, um, I could, how should I put it, in my mind intellectually I can understand that you know you have population aging and what is changing with it in, in, in the region but it wasn't until I came here that I really fully could appreciate the importance of population aging and that governments are seeking answers, they're seeking explanations. But like, like we talked before about the rapid economic growth and as I see it, norms and values not changing, here you have a similar situation in terms of rapid transition, in terms of low fertility, economic growth, and the demographic transition is happening as we speak. While in Europe, for example, it took hundreds of years, or 100, 150 years. So societies had chance to change and, and address the needs of elderly in terms of social services and all of that. So I think that's important to remember that this is, it, it's not a necessarily, it's not a new area of in, in, the, in population and development, but what is new is the uniqueness and that now many governments, are, they realize that this is something that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, it will really threaten the sustainability in, in societies in terms of economic growth. And if you look at it, sustainable development in general. And I don't think, I, I mean, yes, we talked about teenage pregnancies before adolescence, reproductive health, taboo in many societies. If you talk about elderly sexuality, it, you know, older people's sexuality or you know, sexual health, it is not on the agenda yet. You know, you, you, of course you don't talk about reproductive health because we, yes. you know, elderly are through the reproductive health cycles. But here you're actually talking about how elderly should be able to have good sexual health. And you know, they, you know, like anybody else, they have a sexual life, a sexuality, and it needs to be put on the table more uh, squarely. And, and the approach we do at UNFPA, and like I said, and that's why I you know, took some time to introduce it, was that given that it's so new, we, we, we over the maybe past two, three years, we have increased our capacity here in the regional office of UNFPA in Bangkok to talk about population aging and low fertility. And population aging as such, we, we use a life cycle approach to, sexual, to aging and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So investments in adolescents, reproductive health, sexual health, in comprehensive sexuality education, then you come into your reproductive health, maternal health, 
um, parental leave is part of it. So making sure that, you know, women in particular, but also men can take care of the children and that you invest in their in their um, sexual and reproductive health is absolutely fundamental if you know elderly is going to have a you know a, a, a well-being when they when they when they become old, you know when you become older basically and and that you also acknowledge that that you know access to contraceptive or or to to condoms is important also for, for protection so i think we it, it requires more advocacy and discussion and put it on the table in addition to all the many other aspects of aging in terms of social services pension systems and access to health care in general but you know for unfpa side we focus on on srhr in this respect but if you allow me two more minutes which i think you know when we yes. talk about population yes. aging you know the other one is it's discussions around low fertility and here, I, what we can see is sometimes in, in countries, they think, oh, our fertility is going down now. It's be, way beyond replacement level of 2.1 children per woman, which is the total fertility rate when, when, when you have a replacement level of a population. But many countries say, well, why should we then provide contraceptive services or family planning services? Why should we? We should encourage people to have more children instead. And that requires a different kind of conversation with many partners so that you, you have a rights-based approach saying no, according to what all governments agreed to in, in Cairo in 1994. It was agreed that men and women should have access to a range of modern contraceptives. They should be developed, it's their choice on the number of children spacing and with whom. And we cannot compromise on that. And that is then becomes a, you know, a, a different kind of conversation as maybe to, if you go back 20, 25, 30 years ago, when we talked about high fertility rates and you know, how do we make sure that you, you, know, you, you, you can provide voluntary rights-based uh, services so that women you know, uh, decide freely on, on the number and, and, you know, because we know that the more, you know, uh, more economic growth and more development usually leads to lower fertility rate among, among women. Don't turn in a low fertility situation to say, to restrict access to SRHR services and to uh, family planning services. Because that is not the answer to population aging, but that's somehow often how countries or governments see it. So it, it's a it's a it's a very you know it's a very complex discussion that takes place. And you have you know with my with my colleagues all over the region, it is so important that we have that that we can that we are comfortable. And I, I and I, I I do see that that we are that we can have conversation around these topics in society in any country, but that requires again, and this goes back to what I said in the beginning, that we fully understand what's happening in countries in terms of the health system development, economic growth, conservatives backlashes. What is how do we see population and development issues? How do we see sexual and reproductive health and rights issues in countries? Because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a lot about policymakers and laws and how you change behavior from within in societies. Rightly so, rightly so. Your message for APCR SHR 10. That's... It is, you know, we are on the right path. We just need to stay on that. And we need to be aware of what's happening around us. And then we need to be able to be flexible, engaged in respectful discussions so that we can show and provide the evidence on where we, sh where we want to be in our societies around the world. And it's not just about Asia and the Pacific. The, 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 global, the global world, the global, it's so different from, if you go back to even the Cairo conference. So we are really an inter, you know, we, we need to understand 
ourselves in, in, the, in the global concept of values and norms as well. And that's why you have uh, the United Nations. Yes. <laughs> to, to stand for these things that governments have, have adopted in, in, in the General Assembly. Okay, thank you very much. We've had a very enriching dialogue uh, with uh, Mr. Bjorn Anderson. And now I invite the listeners for their comments and questions. If you are using the Zoom platform, please type in your question and comment in the chat box. If you wish to speak, unmute yourself and then ask your question or raise the virtual hand. And if you're watching it on Facebook, you can leave a comment there. We already have a few questions which have come up. And uh, uh, Swapna Majumdar, a very senior journalist from India, wants to ask a question. Yes, Swapna. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Hi, Mr. Anderson. Good to connect with you again after the Nairobi summit. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so my question is actually stems from the Nairobi conference. And uh, what, I, what I wanted to share with you was that the, the new data that was released there at the summit about the cost of achieving the critical goals of zero maternal death, zero unmet need for family planning, and zero gender-based violence and harmful practices was very useful. Uh, that's what I found. But many times governments in the region are reluctant to accept such data or that they are not accepting I lost you there. I, so I think I understood that governments are reluctant to accept those figures which were presented in terms of achieving the three zeros. Is that? Yes. Yes. I cannot hear you now, unfortunately. Can I, can I repeat the question? Uh, can Swapna, I repeat I it? There, yes, please repeat, Swapna, because it is not very clear, the latter part. Just repeating the latter part. Mm. Yes, please. Which is that the governments are reluctant to accept such data or that they are not investing enough. Mm. So my question is, how, how can this data be used to inform policies in a more meaningful way? So I'm lost to that, Swapna, but I understand how can we use this data more effectively to convince governments to invest in achieving the three zeros for sexual and reproductive health and rights. Is that correct? Yes, I think uh, beyond that is what she means, yeah. yes. So yeah. basically, so, so I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned this figure because it was something very new that, that UNFPA presented at the Nairobi summit. And we're talking billions over to, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of money, which is the figure in itself. But what we are now, the next step is that we are going to work at the regional level and we are also selecting certain countries to see what it would cost to invest and achieve the three zeros. So hopefully when a government see, sees that this is related to my country, it would be easy, more easier to have a conversation. But, but you know, you can't just provide that figure. You need to then have a conversation again. How, what does it mean? How, how do we invest? How, do, how does the government make sure it's health services, if it's education or, or, or different differences. But I think the important part is to break, break down this figure so it becomes more relevant for each country in itself. So that's what we work with. Uh, okay, we have a question from Dr. Neelam Singh Thank from Vatsalya. Neelam, would you like to ask your question? Neelam? Uh, if she wants to speak, she has written a question in the chat box yes, and yes. Uh, she wants, Neelam, would you like to ask? Unmute yourself and ask, please. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll call out her question. She wants to know what are some of the sexuality related problems of the elderly? 
we are back to ages. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could answer it very, you know, directly, but I, I uh, this is something that, you know, we, in, in general, if, of course, if you don't have access to to preventing or if, if there are transmit STIs, but, you know, I don't, I don't know the full answer to exactly that, but it's of course important to to also make sure that there, at, at the old age you have, you know, cancer related reproductive health cancer related uh, illnesses that needs to be addressed. Okay, uh, Rita from uh, Jakarta wants to ask a question. Rita, would you like to ask the question? Because uh, yes, thank yes, you so yes. much. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Brown Anderson. Nice to meet you again after we are meeting in Jakarta. Very nice to meet you, Rita. Uh, oh, I would like to ask some question. Indonesia has been successfully uh, in promoting family planning with the use of modern contraceptive 57.2%. Uh, but the admit need uh, is still very high at 11 uh, percent and MMR is still very high, uh, three, 305 deaths for every uh, 10,000 live birth, and most of them are uh, teenagers, teen mothers. Uh, but in Indonesia, in the family planning program, un, uh, unmarried uh, women and teenagers are excluded in the family planning program and they have no access to family planning health services uh, as well as uh, sexual health, reproductive health services. Uh, so there are many unwanted pregnant and they don't know how, where to go. Um, do you think Indonesia is on the right track to achieve the zero, the three zero? and to achieve the 2030 SDG goals while they are ignoring the service to un unmarried women and teenagers. Thank you. Th thank you, Rita. You're really asking one of the core questions. Um, and, and let me answer it like this. In any society, if we're going to reach the three zeros, you need to address um, the the uh, the needs of sexual and reproductive health services for for all pop, for all all people or, or you know populations and um, in countries like Indonesia it is difficult for adolescents to have access to family planning services and information I've seen it myself and I've discussed it also with uh, local government and and especially. You know, you see also changes perhaps in, I, I was in Sulawesi uh, last year and, and saw very, very, um, very advanced clinics in terms of the response from the humanitarian situation. And you had young people, young girls, who also were seeking information in different ways in this, you know, around this clinic, which, which was, you know, possible given the humanitarian situation. But it's also the same with ethnic minorities. If you don't reach them, if you don't reach the, the furthest behind with, with the sexual and reproductive health services, we will not reach the three zeros. So it is important. And this is again, a conversation that we need to have, or not just UNFPA, but everybody of us who are working to improve uh, the SR, SRHR in countries that to show what, what the difference would be if you, if you change perhaps not just norms and values, but laws and policies in countries. Shoba, uh, over to yes, you. Rita, yes, Rita, was your question answered? Yes, uh, thank yes. you. The other thing that I would like to uh, ask is uh, whether the media can play a role in raising awareness of both government and the people and the whole society in addressing this crucial issue. You said the media, absolutely, absolutely. The media has a key, I mean, I, I respect media's independence and that you should choose the stories you want to tell. That is very important, especially where I'm coming from my own country. 
but I've also seen the, the power of media when, when the media is, whether it's on, on TV or radio or, or, or printed media or in social media, that if you, if you are telling a story with what we are saying with a human face, what is happening, um, then you will see uh, impact on people. And that takes, is very, very helpful to make things change in societies. I, I mean, it's really the channel of the voice of, uh, you know, that journalists and, and, you know, communication people have in terms of telling the story and, and, and also showing what works in other countries and also have a conversation on what could be changed in, in your own countries. Um, but it, but, but and, 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 and the thing with sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, it's really that you, you can have a human face, you can link it to an individual, if you like, or to people, and not just have the bigger numbers and changes. Those are important too. But if you want to move people in, in societies and changing people, you need to show what, what is happening. And I, I myself, on, uh, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had the International Day of Female Genital Mutilation or Cutting. So I placed an op-ed in, in, um, in, 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 uh, in Thomson Reuters about the importance to, to see what, what does FGM do to young women or girls, that it is really a human rights violation. And these are the things that, you know, we, we all have to um, communicate around what, what is happening if a girl is circumcised or cut in such a way that she will have, um, she will be suffering throughout the life. Or if worst case scenario, as, as I'm sure you know, girls dying in, in other countries and in other parts of the world from that. Okay. Uh, thank I hope you, I thank you so much. I hope I, Rita, I hope we can get the opportunity sometime in the future to com continue our conversation on this. But. Yes, the conversation has to continue beyond yes. this also. We have a comment on the Facebook page. Uh, Alpha Pokharal wants to know, how can we assess the provider level barriers for respectful maternity care through a quantitative approach? Oh, I wish I had my, my technical expert with me now <laughs> who knows exactly how to work in health systems. But I, to answer that very, very briefly, I, I think it's very much about strengthening capacity with health, health systems strengthening. In, 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 according, you know, if you know, WHO has six interventions that should take place. So it, it's a very holistic approach to strengthen health care systems. And, and making sure that they are focusing and that the, you know, the patients and, and the mothers, pregnant mothers, that their concerns and their comments on quality of care is being addressed. Very brief answer. And then, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Padamra Joshi, who's editor of Health Today in Nepal. And uh, he wants to know, uh, are there any lessons Nepal can, uh, teach to uh, other countries and what can it learn from other countries more from other countries you had mentioned nepal in one of your uh, i've been to yeah. nepal a couple of a few times actually and okay. also again very impressed with the progressive thinking in nepal in terms of how how the government sees uh, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights comprehensive sexuality education exists um, there is uh, an openness to, to the many uh, difficult issues or sensitive issues around sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I think that would be um, a suggestion that, that we as, as a global community can learn what worked well in Nepal and why did it work well in Nepal. Because each country where we see progress and where we have progressive thinking it has its own story where it's coming from. Um, but then again, I think as we move forward together in the region, it's, a, it's you know, learning from one another's, you know, progress and, and learn from one another's mistakes is very important. How do you, I mean, how do you make sure that everybody in Nepal can have access to high quality sexual and reproductive health services, maternal health, access to contraceptives, when you have so many people living in very remote areas in the country. 
and and this is something I, I you know I can see in in many countries that that the access to to health services and for health providers for that matter to reach people in remote areas it is not easy and how do we make sure that a pregnant woman when she delivers or if she has any uh, complications that she can access services i think that's a challenge that um, many countries like nepal uh, with that kind of geography would have to address in the future if we are going to reach the three zeros in the near future thank you thank you for that we have a question from dr khyang ve uh, deputy director ministry of health and sports myanmar and uh, uh, he wants to know how can equity in health approach help to fill fulfill the sexual and reproductive health and rights equity in so, health sorry, say i couldn't hear you so but say that again uh, how can equity in health approach how, how that can help improve sexual and reproductive yes yeah health and rights yes. I, i i mean if if universal health coverage the notion of that is that everyone has a, the right to health basically to realize the right to health and within the right to health you have the right to sexual and reproductive health and that is also something which is part of the icpd program of action from the cairo conference and so each individual regardless of economic status or whatever has a right to access these things then of course there are a number of components that you, you need to be able to make sure that you work with societies and individuals so they understand that they have a right as well as governments as a duty bearer have a right or an obligation to provide services and of course if you're poor if you're living in a poor area or in a remote area you know the need or the access to health services and maternal health services or family planning is much more difficult to 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 you know to to achieve and access so so it's very much from a government's perspective that to see how do we make sure that all parts of a country that that you have clinics that you have services that you know can be provided to to men and women regardless of where they're living or regardless of their economic status so i see i see it but you know here again of course i i'm sure different views but i see it very much from a rights perspective that you know we need to make sure that yeah individual men and women young people that they are aware of their rights in this case the right to health and that the duty bearer in in terms of the government works towards making sure that access is that access is available regardless of where you you're living or regardless of your economic uh, income right right you so yes uh one last question we have overshot the time is yeah, right. but just one more question uh, porsia muedi who is a cns <coughs> excuse me cns health fellow from south africa wants to know are sexual health rights the same in all countries or are they often dictated by the local uh, social and cultural norms i mean this is one a question i i am personally very engaged in in, in terms of what is happening in countries and we need to understand no country is the other one alike regardless whether it's europe asia africa it varies but and it's it's a combination of course you, let me start like this norms and values people's behavior is the foundation in any society then for whatever reason historic reason or other influences there are certain laws and policies being implemented in countries but thing you know these can be changed because no you know norms and values are changing over time and when policy makers realize with whether it's influence from media or from civil society or individual you know movements laws and policies are usually changed but of course we all know that there is a political environment in any country and considerations to be taken but we need to be aware of them and have a, again a conversation around how how does it look like in my country or in the country we we are working so i'm i am very positive that change can happen but we need to tell the story from a human perspective and to make sure that um uh, uh we are not 
going that the what we have gained what we have achieved and we have achieved a lot since cairo in 1994 globally and in many many countries and that was you know very well reflected in in, in the nairobi summit last year that we are not go that 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 we are not losing those gains we have made because you know we also know in in throughout history in many many countries that you know the norms and values and the policies is changing and sometimes it goes back and we cannot accept that women's rights are being compromised we cannot accept that gender equality is not going to be improved all the time and each country and every wherever we are can improve gender equality and women's empowerment because at the end of the day if we don't improve gender equality and women's empowerment and human rights on the other side so that you know we won't be able to achieve the ICPD program of action in its broader sense in terms of sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. And this comes to a, a discussion that human, if you look at the human rights principles, I know that sometimes human rights is seen as a very Western discussions, which I, you know, countries have signed off on it. So it is globally and universal. But if you start talking about the human rights principle of participation, openness, access you know for media to be able to uh, you know write what they want to write in a country these are things which we need to cherish and make sure that it happen because if you allow a vibrant civil society in an organization combined with a strong media and with an openness with parliamentarians and movements you will be able to bring up very sensitive issues and, and now I'm talking about population development and SIHR, but I think this goes for many, many issues in societies in general. But if you can manage that, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying gender equality, women's, women's role and status in societies is key. And we know that where women are stronger and have an influence, things change. But it's also equally important with human rights and the principles around that to be able to move things forward in, in societies. But, but, and that's the challenge we are facing in many, in our discussions, whether it's in countries regionally or globally. But, you know, again, that's, that's, you know, we just need to break down that challenge to make sure that we push the agenda forward in a respectful way, because otherwise it will be backlashes. Thank you thank, very much. Thank you for that question. You can tell that. I yes, yeah. Porsche, he had written it down earlier and sent it to us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, perhaps because of some internet issues which she has at her end. Thank you. And uh, thank you for energizing all of us, uh, Mr. Anderson. And uh, I think one take home message is charity begins at home, and at least all of us viewers. Uh, can start working on it, at least in our own spheres, in our own families. Absolutely. That is from where it will percolate further. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. And, and, and as you said, the dialogue and conversation continues and we need to continue it. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank for you. Being here and thank you today. for listening to me. Much appreciated. And Thanks. I'm looking forward to see as many of you as possible in RIAMSIM in, in May at the conference. Yes, yes. What thank we you. say, inshallah, in Urdu, yes, God be with us. Friends, in the second episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, you were listening to Mr. Bjorn Anderson, Regional Director at UNFPA for Asia and the Pacific Region. APCR SHR 10 Dialogues is a special series of fortnightly online interviews with leaders from Asia Pacific on the theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific, 2030 SDGs vision and 2020 realities. This is also the theme of APCR SHR 10 conference. Co-hosted by APCR SHR 10 and CNS, these online interviews are streamlined, are streamed live every fortnight from February to May 2020 in the lead up to the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Sexual Health and Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights to be held in Cambodia. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode of the dialogues. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.